In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report, we are continuing our series in the book of Daniel, and I actually am going to do a pretty big skip here, not because I don't think that it's worth anything or that I think that it's it's not really worth going over. It's just the 11th chapter of Daniel contains an incredibly complicated prophecy, and it's one that I don't think that you could break down into soundbite clips. Like You would almost need to be in a class specifically on the book of Daniel to be able to really go through the history and the fulfillment of the prophecy and to understand the different aspects of it. So I I may try to do something that's a little bit more long form at some point, but for the chaplain's report, it doesn't really serve our purposes. But suffice it to say that what's going on in this particular passage is that Daniel is receiving a vision of things that have not yet passed from God. And in response to this vision, he is trying to to really comprehend and understand it. And keep in mind, we have the advantage of, of hindsight. He didn't. All these things had not happened at this point. And so there's a fair amount of symbolism, but there's also a lot of literal prophecy. In other words, he, he straight up tells him, okay, the king is going to come from this direction, and he's going to come against this other king. And so there's a lot of specifics in there, and it's amazing that you can really map out and how accurate the prophecy is. But the prophecy is dealing with world affairs, specifically Greece and Rome, and how you're going to have the Medes and the Persians ruling for a while, and then the Greek Empire is going to take over with Alexander the Great. And once Alexander the Great is out of the way, that that kingdom is going to be split up. And then a while after that, then Rome comes in and they become top, top dog for a while. And so you really do have a amazing look ahead for somebody that was living in Daniel's time, even though I'm sure he didn't really understand all of it at the time. But there was a passage that really sticks out to me, and it's talking about after Rome has conquered and talking about the abomination of desolation, in other words, the destruction of the Jewish temple, which happens after Christ died. That seems to be the the era of time in which it's speaking about. And this is the passage where he gives some insight into that period. Daniel eleven thirty two through 33 By smooth words, he will turn into godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now, a couple things that I really want to zero in on when it comes to this passage. First of all, it's a warning. He's saying that smooth words, in other words, words that are delightful, words that you want to hear, words that get people stirred up, words that go down easy, kind of giving you the idea of a food or drink that's smooth. Those are going to lead a lot of people astray. And when the wicked hear these words, they will turn to godlessness. This is going to be a very trying time for the nation of Israel. And because it is very trying, just like any other crisis, you start to see what people are actually made of. Those that have been wicked this whole time and really practice godlessness, but it wasn't obvious, they're going to openly turn towards godlessness. This is the prophecy that Daniel is receiving, that they are going to act wickedly toward the covenant. And so he gives this as a a warning to those who might be caught up in this. In other words, he's giving a warning to the people that are wicked and trying to say, you're, you need to change your ways, you're going to turn to godlessness when this comes. But it's not just a warning to them. In fact, I don't even think the warning is primarily to them. I think the warning is to God's people. Because what he's saying there is, there are going to be people that you didn't think were godless, 
and you're going to find out when stuff hits the fan, they actually were. They were not your allies. They were not people that were serving God. And once this hits, that is going to be made obvious. Once there is chaos, you're going to know who's really on God's side and who really isn't. Because the mask will come off and they will show their true colors. That's a warning that we have to remember today, that there are people, maybe even people that we like, admire, respect, or love, that if a crisis hit, they would show their true colors. Now, most of us, especially if we're keeping a keen eye about this, we kind of have an idea of who that might be. But there are going to be people, even among God's number, even among God's people, that are not going to see some of the people that they, they thought would never betray them actually betray them. God knows, but they're not going to know that. And so by these smooth words, by enticing speech, and things that sound good and seem to make sense, these people are going to be drawn away from God. And unfortunately, we're seeing that in a, a less prominent way play out in our own society, too. There's no great crisis for us to have to deal with, at least not right this second. But the point is, when a crisis does come, when there is great upheaval, it will be very easy to discern, okay, who's really with God and who's really not. And that was true back in Jerusalem, and it's true today too. The second one that he brings out is that he shows a contrast between what we just talked about, these smooth words enticing people, and the people that are actually godly. And what does he say about the people that know their God? That's the words that he uses, someone that actually knows their God and knows who he really is. He says that those people will display strength and take action. See, that's twofold. Displaying strength is good. Being able to be strong in adversity is a very good thing. It is a great quality to have. It's a godly quality to have. But it's still not enough. I greatly admire people that, that don't crack under pressure, that can maintain their faith. But you notice that he doesn't say that it ends there. The people that really know God are going to be strong and display that strength, but they're also going to take action. And so the people that are really gods, the people that are really on his side, yes, they are going to be seen as strong, but they're also going to do something about it. Now, he's not specific on what they're going to do. Again, we have the advantage of hindsight, and we know that a lot of what was going on at that time is that the people of the church, the people that were actually with God, they were trying to help their brothers and sisters. They were trying to take care of those less fortunate or weaker than they were. And so that was going on. And especially when the church was being persecuted, the church grew and grew closer together because of it, because this is the way that people that actually know their God act. Which is saying what? That the people that actually know God, this is going to be their reaction to it. In other words, to know God is to do his work. To know God is to act like God. It's good to have faith. It's good to have inner strength. That is absolutely essential. That's something that we as Christians are called to have. But it's no substitute for action. You have to have that and the action. You have to have faith and obedience. It's two things that go together. And if you don't have both, you're not somebody that really knows God. That's what this verse is actually saying. And then finally, a very sad prediction. That um, they yet they will fall by the sword and by flame, captivity and by plunder for many days. Now, this is something that is unfortunately a truth of the human condition. Especially when we're talking about God and, and the history of the scripture. People will often say and actually use as an argument against God that, well, there's just so much suffering in the world. But they forget that God didn't spare even his own son from suffering. And so do we really think that we being less than him, being an adopted child as opposed to a, an, an actual begotten child like Jesus, 
that we're going to be spared from suffering if he wasn't? Think about that. Christians are going to suffer, and they're specifically going to suffer for doing what God says. Because the same people we were just talking about, the ones that are faithful enough to have the inner strength and peace and faith that they're supposed to have, and couple that with action, doing something about it, helping their brothers and sisters, trying to remedy the problem, even those people, the ones that really know God, the Bible is predicting that they are going to suffer. That they're specifically going to fall by sword and by flame and by torture, persecution, that all of these things are going to happen to God's people. And what's fascinating about that is it talks about them doing something and showing strength, and this is going to be happening to them when this goes on, which tells you what? Suffering is not a sign of weakness. That actually the ones that are going to be the strongest are going to be the ones that suffer this kind of fate. You see, sometimes I genuinely wonder about myself and about my fellow Christians. America is a wonderful country. We have it pretty good here. And there's a lot of ease and comfort and convenience here. But I wonder if sometimes, if the fact that we're not suffering a whole lot may be indicative of the fact that maybe we're not really doing what we're supposed to do. And I get that this was a very specific time and this was a very specific prediction for a specific crisis that was going to happen, and we're not really in crisis mode right now in this country. I get that there's a distinction there. I understand that. But I think that if we're not sacrificing something, if we're not undergoing some kind of persecution or some kind of stress because of being a Christian and trying to do what God tells us to do, I genuinely wonder if we're really living out the first part of that verse. That we really know God because we are acting in faith and showing strength and coupling that with taking action. And maybe if we're not experiencing the last part of this verse, the last part of this passage, it's because we're not doing the first half, which is having faith in God and being obedient to that faith. That's something that we should all strive for. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus. But I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.